Hello, my name is Fembe Ali. I'm the country lead for the Tobacco Control Data Initiative, and I'm here speaking with Mr. Philip Jacko. Can you please introduce yourself, sir? Philip Jacko, Director of Programs, Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa. Thank you. Uh, can you also introduce yourself, Mr. Body? My name is Olaf Mimati Wakimode. I'm the Executive Director of Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa, CAPA. Mr. Jacko, can you tell us about your background in tobacco control and what drew you to this work? Hmm. Well, um, I started off as a journalist. And uh, as a journalist, I covered agriculture. Uh, so it afforded me the opportunity to also be interested in reporting tobacco farms, farm, tobacco farmers. Now, I worked under an editor who, I won't say fortunately, because we're talking about an industry that kills, uh, who unfortunately would send me to, you know, uh, cover, you know, activities of British American Tobacco and other tobacco uh, companies operating in the country. As at this point, and that was like 2003, 2004, 2005, I had not known much about the arms of tobacco. But I remember this particular incident. I, I, think, I think that was 2005. I was part of a team of journalists that British American Tobacco took to a place called Aguare, uh, where BAT has a demonstration farm and the same the community nearby where you have a lot of tobacco farmers. And I think that was the turning point because before myself and the other journalists from Lagos taken to your state, visited me, heard so much about what BAT was doing, you know, among the farmers, how they were prosperous farmers, how you know things like that. And when I when we drove into the community, all I saw was poverty. The roads were not good, rustic buildings, and I had the opportunity of asking, uh, I think, BET public relations manager then, um, I think I can mention his name, uh, one Kennedy Johnson. I, I was the only one among the journalists who asked him that question, like, you mentioned so much about what you've done for this community, but all I see here is poverty. All I see here is rustic uh, buildings, Everywhere is dusty red. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. But I remember what the, his response was that, oh, it's, uh, well, it's the government that is supposed to do that. So, uh, we, we, you know, pay all those things we are supposed to pay. Government is supposed to do this. But I came back and wrote what I saw, which was poverty. Fortunately, around that period, it was almost like it was a coincidence. Um, one or two or three days after I got to the office and there was a press statement which came from the Environmental Rights Action, which was the organization uh, we worked with before, uh, before now. And the press statement actually came from the uh, body. <laughs> and it was all about uh, tobacco industry corporate social responsibility and the lies, everything they do to, you know, um, portray themselves as socially responsible and, you know, dissuading people from looking at the arms of what they do. And I was like, this this is it, this is what this is the truth. Yeah. I started reporting, you know, the other side. And fortunately, two years down the line, the environmental rights action invited me to work with them. So my background was actually journalism, but then when I saw what the industry was doing, I felt I should report that and not just the you know the, the lies that they were putting out and that was the foundation. So in the environmental rights action, we had uh, Bode worked. He was uh, the head of the Lagos office that was doing all those expose of what the industry was doing. I found that joy, the opportunity to actually report things for what it is. So that is where I started from. That's my journey into tobacco control. That's and that was 2007. Great. That's yeah. great. That's great. And to go a little bit off tangent, is that how you both met? I, I think he, he spotted me. <laughs> he spotted me. I <laughs> and, <laughs> Once you saw that article? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, we actually put him on the watch mm -hmm. because at that time, um, for the tobacco, it's Africa, you see journalists that's not on the pocket of the tobacco industry. And so it was a huge, huge challenge for us to get what I would call then the alternative story mm -hmm. out, in the, out of the media because the tobacco industry was destroyed. Tobacco control was like the alternative voice. Mm. Then, and the industry was having a field day in the media. They would take journalists on tours, they would take them to hotels, you know, all sorts of things. And so 
I mean, I just started noticing this journalist who want to balance the story, who we want to, you know, and then we started sending him a press statement. I was looking also over time as uh, his political analysis, a uh, lot of stuff over time, by a period of like two years. Mm -hmm. And then one by one seven p.m. and I remember it was around seven thirty eight p.m. <laughs> I just gave him a call, which I believe shocked him. That and it was a very straight one. <laughs> Philip, would you like to work with us? <laughs> Simple, but well, that was a straight call. Right. <laughs> and, <he> said, yeah. <laughs> and the rest is very easy. It's history. history. <laughs> it's been wonderful ever since. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's lovely. And so, Mr. Bodhi, maybe that's a good good time to draw it back a bit. Can you tell us how you? particularly also got into tobacco control. What is it that drew you into tobacco control? Well, I, for me, it's a childhood experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew up in the village, um, very bad road. And so when I was going to secondary school, I had to go to secondary school, it's like three villages from my village, that means from my village, about 30 kilometers of very rusty mm -hmm. roads to my village. So the vehicle, if I should come home for weekend, you know, I was not a body student, and my dad couldn't afford the body of the body house. So I was a state student in another village. Um, and so if I should come home for a weekend, you have to go back with a very early morning vehicle mm -hmm. that leaves the village like around 5.30. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the driver of commercial buses represents the most affluent people mm -hmm. you can come in contact with. Mm -hmm. In my village, and part of how to show a place is to smoke. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you ever lived with the smoker when they smoke and foul the air 6 a.m., 5 a.m. There is a way that thing is so, so bad. And I was a young kid of about 11, 12, and you see these drivers puffing into your nose. Mm -hmm. So I, I developed that childhood hatred mm -hmm. for against. Smoking. And so a lot of people always ask me whether I've ever smoked when I was shouting as a campaigner. I never did. So when I came to environmental rights action, we were doing environment, you know, you know corporations like Shell were fighting them. I know that was when um, BAT, almost at the point that BAT entered Nigeria, mm -hmm. and they escalated their adverts on TV. So I will um, complain. Mm. I don't but everybody knows that this is wrong, everybody knows that. I mean, we don't know more than tobacco is dangerous as at that time. Mm -hmm. we, I never knew there is a, that governments around the world were making laws. So I will complain. Then my boss then wrote to Douglas is late. I didn't know he was also noticing the fact that I complained about tobacco companies and mm -hmm. the fact that I don't like cigarettes. Because look, I can just not stand where people smoke. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Now, it now Coincidentally, that was when the work on FCTC started. It, it didn't start with the negotiation, it started with what they call intergovernmental negotiation, mm -hmm. IMBs, which were the preparations towards the FCTC around 9, 2000, 2001, and then about. So there are, WHO got in touch with some big foundations, groups mm -hmm. around the world to also look at NGOs that had worked on convention and treaty. So I think that's how environmental rights popped up, mm -hmm. and a group in um, US then, in fact, got in touch with environmental rights action uh, because environmental rights action had worked on the United uh, Nations Paper Commission on Climate Change that okay, there is a plant treaty, and we need groups in Africa mm -hmm. to also add to the voice. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Oronto went to the first meeting, it became FCTC, mm -hmm. and he packed all the books and he came on a Friday and said, for day you have been complaining about the tobacco industry. <laughs> there is yes, something now that you are doing all the materials. We are calling a press briefing on Monday. It was a Friday, I always remember. Mm -hmm. It was a Friday. Mm -hmm. We are calling a press briefing on Monday to start our control campaign in Nigeria. So I had to read all the books that he brought over couple of three days mm. and by Monday morning I was facing journalist as tobacco control <laughs> 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 no, that was and that's how your journey started. That's how the journey started. That's wonderful. 
Um, when we started working with you, um, I know that you were still with the Environmental Rights um, Action. Action and has since then transitioned to CAPA. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think uh, the transition has to do with the fact that we needed a broader platform um, to be able to take the issue of corporate accountability uh, as a core campaign team on the African continent. Yeah, when you look at environmental rights action, it's essentially uh, environment focused um, NGO. And um, we just think that we needed more space. We needed to look at a lot of corporate issues related to our development. And most importantly, we think that we can also build alliances uh, with others across the African continent. That's always been my dream to work with partners across uh, the region, not necessarily establishing offices, uh, to be able to model a kind of campaigning, mm -hmm. to mod, um, model a kind of strategy mm -hmm. in campaigning, and that's what uh, Kappa is essentially about. Mm -hmm. And so we we try to we, we then move to Kappa. That's really great, and we've really enjoyed working with you and both and wearing both hats. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So what was it about CCDI that made you think, okay, I can work with these people? I can I can invest my time here. What was that? So frankly, the skepticism is my default. Mm -hmm. If you are if you've gone through it, for instance, I received several emails. Oh, I'm a postgraduate student mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Oxford. Yeah. We are working on. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not respond mm -hmm. until I can get someone or find the time mm -hmm. myself to dig in and validate. And I I, I share with you. I mean, I don't want to mention names. I mean, once I've made a mistake, one of the biggest conspiracy firms in the world uh, said you are collecting data. But by the time they started the questionnaire, I, I cancelled it and I said I'm no longer interested. Mm. So with that, that was it. Now, at the time, Rachel intervened, and then I also went online, which is the basic thing we do. Uh, we do apologies. Uh, read everything that you could see, we'll check your board, we'll check your staff, we'll try to try the linkage, okay, where has you go to linkage, where has this one work with? yes. We can be it's a lot of fact we, checking. We can be nasty when it comes to getting new analysis and investment. Then we were really very sure that okay, this is a legit system of that's that's really good. And of course, we've done a great job of putting you on my toes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't say my, it's uh, well. <laughs> Thank you. You are doing a very good job. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Jaco, can you also tell us how you got involved in the Tobacco Control Data Initiative and what it is that made, drew you to this work? Well, I think for me, it's um, almost the same trajectory as a uh, body. Uh, I know. I received uh, an email and then um, with the kind of work we do, just like you mentioned, um, once you receive that mail, the first thing you want to do is to do that background checks and uh, know how clean that organization is. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yes, we well, checked and, you know, there was no tie to the industry. I'm sure before you guys won't try to reach us, you must have done the same thing. So uh, we, we check each other mm -hmm. and uh, that was done. And then I received a call from you, and uh, you mentioned sending, you know, uh, a document that you wanted us to go through and see the things you guys are doing that you would like us to be involved in. And uh, ever since then, it's been a very, very um, forward-looking relationship. Um, and then. Uh, like what they mentioned, you've been on our toes, <laughs> you know. You send the mails and you do the calls, so if you miss this, you won't miss this. So it's, it's been uh, lovely. That's so really wonderful. One thing I would like to add mm -hmm. is that why I also build interest is because I also recognize the need for what this project is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So here is the thing, I've been in the control for several decades and um, Usually, we want to convince policymakers, mm -hmm. and um, you just need to have the data in a in a in a manner that you can easily pull up, pull up, pull up and yes. use for advocacy. And um, 
that's not existing. Mm. 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 We attempted something about 15 years ago under a project we call African Tobacco Control Regional Initiative, mm. where we wanted to do something we call the African Tobacco Resource Center. Mm. You know, but that was basically to just to warehouse available research. You know, in in Africa, where we have that there, you have these pockets of research mm. here over mm. there, and nobody has really sat down to interpret them and make meanings out of them. Yeah. Look, I'm not a researcher. I used to tell people. Mm -hmm. I use refined finished products. And so when that opportunity came or opened, mm -hmm. I, I kind of embraced it to see, look, this is what we need. I mean, this is, for instance, if a journalist now wants to write mm -hmm. on Google, I mm -hmm. would say, don't worry, just go to this dashboard, mm -hmm. everything you need is there. You, you understand? Exactly. It makes my job easier when I can just quickly pull out a, a page and go and speak to a policymaker, and I can also tell the journalist, go mm -hmm. there. That's right. See, I cannot dig out fast, so it's already done. Mm -hmm. You have a ton of uh, uh, products mm -hmm. you can use. So I think it's just it's because mm -hmm. this is needed yeah. at this particular point in time. I might also want to add, uh, because uh, like you mentioned, the work we do with journalists, one of the issues we've had over time is um, some people tell you, oh, uh, this report is about the health. Yes, we, we, we all know 8 million people die annually. Mm -hmm. And tobacco control is not made sexy, mm -hmm. if I were to use that word. Yeah. Now, the reason why you have that is because Journalists have restricted themselves to reporting, for instance, just you know eight million people citing, of course, the WHO statistics, but not looking at other crucial data that we can use. The data you have on the dashboard are stories on their own. Journalists will look at it and say, "Okay, uh, the data here, let's use it for something," and then you know it, it never existed. Even ourselves as activists, apart from the WHO and some researchers that are you know, published, which is far away from us, we, we also scrape the net to get information. But here you are, something that you can readily go to, mm -hmm. the data from there, you use it for, for your work. That is wonderful to hear. Thank you for saying that. Um, maybe as a follow-up um, to, to, to what, how you're already um, looking at the dashboard, is you've seen this dashboard start from you know, the staging, the inception where we had the write-ups and then we had the staging site that has been iterated and validated and you all have given your feedback until this point now where we have the final product. Um, what is your what is your understanding of how you envision using that dashboard in the work that you do in like tangible ways? I think I've answered that without repeating myself. The, the dashboard has made my job easy. For instance, if I go to do any briefing, mm -hmm. I can easily go and look at prevalence, I can look at prevalence across the ages, I can look at, I mean, so it's easily spelled out for Nigeria. So a lot of the time, there were not, we, we don't have that country specific breaking down. But if you look at the back of Atlas, you know, it will take you time to look me mm -hmm. If you look at, I mean, so many of those mm -hmm. data sources, and even for you to get to what you have on the dashboard, you have to like look at a lot of primary, secondary data, and then begin, and then see through them, and then be able to get what you get. So you have saved me a lot of time and energy, mm -hmm. and of course, even provided the expertise that I don't have, mm -hmm. but giving me the product that I need to do my work. That's that's number one. Number two is what he said. We do a lot of work with journalists mm -hmm. and. Often they will say give us Nigerian data. Mm -hmm. if, for a very long time, we couldn't resolve the very mm -hmm. crucial one how many people die in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were just doing extrapolation. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Oh, 5.6, uh, yeah, is it 5.6 mm -hmm. is what got to 2013. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you look at the population, mm -hmm. then you then, you know, that's kind of a lot of assumptions. Exactly, a lot of assumptions. But mm -hmm. we, we just know that that's what we see and not, ex not really, really scientific. Yeah. So that's what this now say was that we can convincingly say mm -hmm. this is the these are the figures mm -hmm. for Nigeria. Right. This this wonderful. Do you yeah. have anything to add? 
Well, uh, I, the, he has said it all. I often begin to journalism students. students. Students also come to us. They, they are doing researches, on, they are doing things on tobacco, they need figures. Mm -hmm. You know, our argument had always been well, we are not uh, researchers, but we, you can search the net, you can find things, we can only see what we've got to know over time. Mm -hmm. But pointing them to specific data mm -hmm. relating to specifics right. had not been there, and now you have it. So it's a pool of resources, not only for journalists, for students, for policy makers, and it's something that was developed. You know, with expertise from, you know, crucial stakeholders in the sector. So it's it's a it's a it's a, a nice document. That's wonderful. Mm. Um, I don't know about you, but I know that I have a favorite, and most people tend to have. So just to to hear from you, if you have a favorite uh, aspect or maybe a particular graphic or section on the dashboard that particularly stands out to you. I think I think it's the prevalence, prevalence, of course, you know, uh, because it, it has a human face. Mm -hmm. So people want to know that age group that um, is affected more by tobacco use. People are interested in those kind of it's For story writing, for instance, the human angle, it brings it out. Uh, so uh, me too, I think uh, it stands out for me. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. wonderful. And and with the prevalence, um, I remember that when we were working with you, Mr. Bode, um, one of the uh, um, feedback we gotten from you was to break, to just break that data down mm -hmm. and disaggregate it down to exactly. gender, to by age. zones, yeah. age, exactly. um, and all of that. And that was really helpful because it's gotten a lot of great feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. because it was really helpful. Prior to having the TCDI uh, dashboard. Um, what was your n usual source of data and information? Okay, 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 okay. you are fine. <laughs> well, of course, the WHO is always there. Um, but like we always see, and uh, but they also referenced it, you need to back at last is also there, but you need to do a lot of work. You know, uh, getting to the it's, it's it's a global thing, so it's not like a Nigeria specific thing. And the information you have about Nigeria is, of course, not very comprehensive. Um, so here we have a dashboard that is Nigeria specific and touches on even before the the the, we, the conclusion of what should be on the dashboard, mm -hmm. a lot of um, you know engagements, listening to people who work in public health was uh, was organized so we had the opportunity of seeing what we think should be there that is currently that was missing before the, the dashboard was uh, was uh, uh, was created so um that uh, for me is very very important because now you have a nigeria specific um uh, information you don't have to script that's what we used to do you script for information mm -hmm. you know you go on google mm -hmm. and the information you will have to verify so it's like you see this here you know like the team of the world no tobacco day yeah. now uh, some say protect the environment so it's some say tobacco and the environment of course yes, uh, if you, it, it's it's disjointed but they're all saying the same thing but now you need something that you can really rely on and you can also verify the source and it is of course the, the, the dashboard is very very easy to use uh, not high saluting language students can use it like i said policymakers can use it the media can use it anybody who is learning can just look at it and understand what it is the graphics uh, tell the story it's not complicated and i think that is very very important that's wonderful thank you